Okay, the four stages in the life of a sermon. I'm going to call them before preparing. They've got really, really jazzy titles. Before preparing. Preparing. You knew that was coming, didn't you? Writing and revising. And delivery. I've called my address good to great because I imagine everyone's come to this event because they know they can prepare a good sermon. Several people have already told me that. (laughs) But they want to know how to prepare a great one. Or maybe several hundred great ones. I'd like to make some suggestions with reference to the sermon I preached this morning. So I'm kind of assuming you were here this morning. Okay, straight in, before preparing. There are broadly four moments of receiving a sermon. One is the live experience in the midst of liturgy, embedded in the hearer's personal circumstances, the community's events, and wider national and international dramas. The second is the memory of that sermon as it plays in the listener's heart later that day, week, year, decade, lifetime, as they read that scriptural text again, as they face that crisis of which you spoke, as they hear another sermon on that text. The third is the preacher's ongoing relationship with the listener, as they hear others of your sermons, as they compare them to the sermon in life of your pastoral example and practice, which Stephen spoke this morning, as they measure up their notion of God and the church and the kingdom with the one you portrayed that day. The last is a relatively new phenomenon. It's the experience of the person who wasn't there on the day but comes across your sermon on a YouTube video, on a podcast recording as a text on a website or blog, or even just possibly a hard copy, do you remember those? (laughs) Lovingly sent by their affectionate but anxious granny. We're experiencing that fourth one right now, at least you guys at home are. Here's the first question. What do I want the congregation to experience as they listen, remember, digest, or as they engage third hand? I suggest you want them to remember the interplay of two things. On the one hand, there's the intimacy of God. God is talking to me, knows my struggles, understands who I am, and loves me. The siren calls of Albanoni or Mendelssohn are truly God calling to me. My tussles in desire and longing and frustration and grief are really tussles with the angel of the Lord. God is as close to me as my heart is to my soul. And God loves me in a way I will never love myself. Put clumsily, in cliché, platitude, or heartless theodicy, these truths are worse than useless. Whispered gently across the pillow of trust and tenderness, these are life-changing discoveries all the more so because a horrifyingly high percentage of Christians have somehow been inculcated with a very different message from pastor or parent. On the other hand, there's the awesomeness of God. God is Lord of the universe. God's story encompasses every story, God is beyond, beneath, and above. It's lovely to believe God knows us and loves us immeasurably better than we know or love ourselves, but it's just as important to remember that this one who knows and loves us is the creator and redeemer (coughs) of the universe. Christianity is the place where these two convictions meet. 
And here's the crucial part. The intimacy increases the awe, not the opposite. With film stars, Nobel Prize winners, or former princesses, you tend to find that the greater the intimacy, the less the awe. You just don't want to know about the tawdryness of their real, complex lives. But with God, the awe and the intimacy go together. God is completely intimate and completely cosmic. Preaching is about communicating both and their interplay with one another in thrilling terms. Afterwards, you want an intimate silence and an awed hush. You want people to be saying things like, I never realised. Don't know if that what you were, that's what you were saying at quarter to ten this morning, but that's what I wanted you to be saying. I never realised. When I was 19, I went to Yellowstone Park. I didn't really know much about it, except the famous geezer Old Faithful. So when I followed a sign that said scenic viewpoint and walked around a rocky outcrop and saw the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen, I had this most amazing <coughs> sense of grace because I hadn't realised there was such a thing as the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. I'd heard of the Grand Canyon, <coughs> but I'd never heard of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. But here it was. I'd stumbled into it and I knew I'd never forget it. I had no idea. That's what you want your congregation to say. That's the awe. But what about the intimacy? I recently spent some time with a doctor friend who works in a Malawian government hospital. She described one ward round of three hours seeing 56 patients sharing 32 beds. Three quarters of the patients had HIV. This is what she said. This is a quotation from the British Medical Journal. The first call was to the diarrhea side room, a sobering array of wasted bodies and sunken eyes. The floor was wet with poorly mopped spills from bedpans. The first bay was reserved for patients with meningitis, strokes, and paraplegia. I crawled under half a bed. I crawled half under a bed, I beg your pardon, with the house officer to show him the sensory level of a man with paraplegia. Urine seeped from the mattress onto our knees. Relatives were leaning in through the windows, anxious, listening, watching, commenting. One called across, asking me to treat his cough. I told him where to find the clinic. As we passed the nurse on her drug round, a man from the other half of the ward pulled at my cloak coat sleeve. Help me. The nurse told him that someone would see him later. The second bay was pneumonia, tuberculosis, jaundice. Another patient was tapping my shoulder and demanding that I help with his stomach pains. We hastened through several cases of chronic cough in the last bay and were done. I issued a closing pep talk and turned to leave. Passing the noisy relatives, I felt an insistent tug on my coat hem. Not again. I whipped round, suddenly angry and impatient to get out. It was one of the patients on the floor in the second bay. Could he not see how hard we'd worked? I didn't bother to conceal my irritation and said, I've already heard your problem. What do you want now? He looked up at me earnestly. Nothing, doctor. You look tired. I think you could share my beans. He pushed his watery hospital meal on its plastic plate across the concrete floor toward me. I'd seen the face of Christ. That's the intimacy. It should choke you up with the intimacy and grace of God. How do you get that interplay of awe and intimacy, for which the official word is revelation? By talking about the Bible. 
Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? Say the disciples on the way to Emmaus. By opening the scriptures, you are saying the Bible is God's limitless gift. You, that's you, the whole church, can receive it. It's not just for theology professors, for pious people with daily two-hour quiet times and leather-bound dog-eared tomes, for charismatic people who see God's healing hand 17 times a day. It's for every Christian. And part of the way you say that is to preach on the Old Testament. The great thing about the Old Testament is that it really is news to most of our congregations. <laughs> and if truth be told, to most of us preachers. <coughs> so you're all the more likely to get people saying, I never realized. I had no idea. And if you're sitting thinking, but I don't know the Old Testament very well, then I'm saying you've got preaching completely wrong. <coughs> preaching isn't telling people what you've long known. It's inviting people into the mystery of what you're in the process of discovering. <coughs> I truly believe God has given us everything we need to be disciples ministers and missionaries. Our problem is not that God hasn't given enough, but that we choose not to use what God has given us. If you've never preached a sermon on the book of Ezekiel, then I rest my case. Preparing. So, the first principle of preaching is you want to communicate the awesomeness and yet the intimacy of God. And the second principle is that the Bible seems small and far away, but turns out to reveal to us everything we need. Now it's time to turn to the readings for the day. Gently, tenderly, and prayerfully, you read through the three or four readings assigned for a conventional Sunday or festival service. And deep in your heart, you listen to the things that give you a jolt, because they surprise you, delight you, confuse you, or trouble you. What is it, reading this, that bothers me, that I can't wriggle out of, that moves my soul, that maybe in a half dozen words says it all? You have the beginning of a powerful sermon if you have the courage to stay in that place till revelation comes. Scriptural commentaries will usually focus and drill down those gut reactions, and they may evoke new points of joy, dread, wonder, or fascination. I usually try to read between five and ten commentaries on every passage I'm planning to preach on. Sooner or later, Something will go ping, and I know I have to explore it, dig into it, relish it, ponder it, shake it, till it gives up its gold coin. Then I'll usually go in one of two directions. Either I'll focus in on just a handful of words that seem to demand exploration, or I'll look at a whole story or episode to examine its structure and shape, to examine its structure and, sh and, and, and the sh what shape that may give that's of larger significance. You can tell which of those I was doing this morning. From then, I start to build a plan for a sermon that develops an argument. It's not a sermon unless it has an argument. It's not a sermon unless it has an argument. 
Most of my arguments come in one of two forms. Either they establish a problem and by stages resolve it, or they identify a mystery and gradually <laughs> enter and enjoy it. This morning's sermon was clearly of the second kind. It should go without saying that the sermon should accord with the rhythm and grain of the text. But I can't tell you how many sermons I've listened to that don't. It's unfortunately common to hear a sermon that's somehow an organised protest against the text, that communicates the preacher's discomfort with what the text is saying and somehow regards that as salutary for the congregation to hear. Abraham should never have taken Isaac up that mountain. It was inhuman. What kind of a God expects people to make those kind of sacrifices? Amen. <laughs> Thanks for that. Really, really helpful. Discomfort with the text is absolutely fine. But that's for the time of preparation, not for the time of writing. Keep wrestling and share with the congregation what you find. The wrestling itself isn't interesting to anyone but you. It's also regrettably common to hear a sermon that uses a scriptural text as the beginning of a kind of thematic word association, a kind of improvisation game, where the preacher clusters together a bunch of anecdotes or illustrations that seem relevant or resonant with this story or sentence. Both of these aberrations fail to go with the grain and rhythm of the text. They make preaching harder than it needs to be and leave the congregation thinking discipleship is rather more complex and unappealing than they might have imagined when the sermon began. Here are four principles I try never to deviate from in preparing a sermon. Number one. Work out the last line and write it down on a piece of paper before you write the first line of the sermon. You may have a structure that makes an argument, then outlines some implications, but it should almost always end by returning to a clinching climax. If your argument has established a problem and by stages resolved it, your last line will probably be a carefully crafted revelation. If your argument has identified a mystery and gradually entered and enjoyed it, your last line will probably be a careful repetition of what you've already said. <coughs> My sermon this morning was of the second kind. Number two, structure your argument. In practice, you've got broadly two options. Either you start with the text, and then, having identified the key point in the text, you come out of it and explore that point in discipleship, ministry, or mission. Or you start outside the text and spend your opening remarks identifying the point in question, and then flip to the text to see that the text is about to disclose hidden truth and depth to amplify that point. Today's sermon took the latter course. If your argument is carefully structured, then your congregation will have no difficulty in following it. And if the point is existentially vital, then they'll be hanging on your every word. Number three, don't start writing until you have the whole argument and the last line. Start when you can't wait. If you're not bursting to tell the congregation the good news that you've discovered in your preparation and reflection, then you're probably not ready to start writing. The idea that it will somehow come to you when you're in the process of writing is almost always a fantasy. Number four. Illustrations must advance your argument. 
not deepen the problem or amplify your starting point. Far too often, preachers use illustrations that distract from, confuse, or even contradict the point they're making. A sermon isn't an assemblage of random information relevant to a subject. It's an unveiling of the holy of holies, from outside and downhearted to face to face with God and beholding the glory. The distracting illustration is almost always a sign that the preacher deep down has lost confidence in his or her argument and settles for amusing or interesting his or her congregation rather than transforming them. The question of anecdotal or literary or personal reference probably takes me more time than any other part of the preparation. I simply sit in a chair, close my eyes, and ponder as deeply as I know what connection, typology, event, or story this point deeply resonates with, and then try to be as rigorous and patient and honest as I can in discerning whether the story is apposite, appropriate, and mine to tell. Before leaving this phase, I should say that not all my sermons are exegetical. About one time in five, I'll depart from the method I've outlined and respond to a pressing or topical issue in community, church, or world. You get the right to do that if people trust that you have opened their eyes and heart and souls to the glory. You don't get to do that if you've lost confidence in the Bible or your ability to glean joy from it and settle for preaching newspaper editorials or blogs instead. Writing and revising. By this stage, I hope it's clear that most of the real work has been done. As I write, I'm sticking pretty closely to my prepared structure and building up to my last line. Then as I revise, I have four questions in my mind, and these are perhaps the key ones in going from good to great. The first is, does the sermon show real nuance of the complexity of faith and the texture of life? In today's sermon, I try to bring this out by highlighting the difference between the terms precious honoured and loved, and dwelling carefully on what it means to be loved but not honoured, or honoured but not loved. If your congregation trusts that you see the true complexity of faith and life, do you know what you're talking about, as Stephen put it this morning? They will trust the resolution you offer to the struggles they all too well know. The second is, how is my tone of voice? Do I sound generous-hearted, compassionate, gentle, yet clear? Or is there a harshness, a throwaway recklessness, a judgmental denunciation, a superficial generalization that could undermine all the good things I want people to hear and cherish? Do I sound clever or wise? Is my illustration about myself attention-seeking or a subtle form of boasting or self-promotion? Could I tell the same story as if it were about someone else to equally good, good effect? Are all the examples about men? Is the humour laughing with or at? The third question is, is my argument moving at the right pace? I may be very familiar with the fact that Israel went into exile or that Jesus' choice of 12 disciples corresponds with Israel's 12 tribes, but am I racing too fast for the congregation to keep up? When I get to my key points, have I prepared the listener to know this is the big moment or structured in a sufficient element of surprise? 
Is there enough lightness of touch to help the listener maintain concentration throughout? Are there enough signposts to ensure the listener never gets lost? Am I unwise to be making a four-step argument and could I do all I need to do in three? Is there anything the congregation need to have in their hands to help them grasp what I'm doing? That's why I created the arrow structure in the order of service this morning. If you're a Saturday night preacher, you never get to do that. Preaching is a team game. Can the choice of hymns or anthems or the theme of intercessions or introductions complement what I'm planning to say? It always makes me really cross when people say the Holy Spirit only comes to me at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night. Well, how then is the Holy Spirit working through the person doing the intercessions or the choir rehearsing the hymns on a Wednesday night? Have a bit of respect for the other ministers that are taking part in the liturgy. It's not all about you. Fourth, what single thing do I want the listener to be humming, praying, repeating, or treasuring a day, a week, or a decade later? What will be the memorable takeaway? Surely not try harder to love your daughter. This morning it was very simple. You are precious, honoured, and loved. And so is Israel. And so is Jesus. How do I make that simplicity so elegant it's infectious and irresistible? And finally, delivering. A sermon isn't fundamentally a written document, but the event of, re but the event of reading out or relaying a love letter. Delivering should be about conveying a letter drenched in love from God to the congregation. You are speaking to the people for God. The congregation should feel like it. When you're bringing good news, smile. When you're saying hard things, say them tenderly and gently. Don't be embarrassed. You don't need to earn the listener's respect. You have, in some formal or informal way, been commissioned to do this today or regularly. Enjoy the privilege and fulfill the responsibility to the utmost of your ability. Make this the best sermon you have ever preached. And if you fear the text isn't your very best, make the delivery your very best. Don't reveal your discomfort or insecurity by making unnecessary jokes or comments as you begin that don't add to what you've truly got to say. If it's really necessary to acknowledge someone for inviting you or some such other introductory remark, clearly distance that from the sermon itself by saying your invocation after your opening comments to indicate a significant change of mood. Don't ad-lib offhand comments however humorous, as you go along. It's very unlikely they'll be as valuable as what you've prepared, and they may be catastrophically, if unintentionally, hurtful, offensive, or inappropriate. Most of the things I've regretted saying in sermons have been off the cuff, often in relation to an unexpected noise, interruption, or equipment failure. Take your time, trust you have something blessed to say, and cherish the words that may be familiar to you, but are fresh and life-giving to the congregation. And recognize the value of eye contact. It's not necessary to have eye contact with everybody all the time. I used to use a text only very seldom so as to maximize the intensity and immediacy of what I was saying. But I came to realize how much people 
engage with a sermon by reading it again later or by reading it without having been there at its actual delivery. And for those experiences, you need to provide a text. But you can have the best of both worlds if you're sure to memorize key sentences, most obviously your last line. If that wasn't all uncompromising enough, I'm going to finish with two uncompromising statements in answer to the two most common reactions to what I'm saying. The first reaction is, I don't have the ability. I say, I bet you drive a car. The first time you sat in the driver's seat, I bet, like me, you had no idea what you were doing. In my case, I drove into a hedge. <laughs> and even three weeks after I passed my test, I wrote off a car by not looking where I was going. A car can do immense damage. So can a sermon. A car can also take you to the most beautiful and precious and wonderful places in the world. So can a sermon. What's the secret? Stick to the rules, keep filling it with petrol, and get better at it. The second and final reaction is, I haven't got the time. I say this. The awesome God of heaven and earth longs to be revealed in all intimacy to the people who are pining to behold the glory and be transformed by the renewing of their hearts and minds and souls and lives. And you have been called, commissioned, and given the priceless opportunity to be the messenger of that wondrous story, and you've got more important things to do. Really? message ends. Either ponder for a few moments or elbow your neighbour, see what they think, and in a couple of minutes we'll run round with microphones. Okay, that's enough chat. 
I had an RE teacher growing up, and uh, we were very, very cruel. I'm sure you were never very, very cruel, but I was very, very cruel growing up. And we used to inch our desks further and further forward when he was writing on the blackboard. And he got wise to this, as you wouldn't be surprised to know, and he used to say, you've had your fun, you've had your fun, in a voice that suggested it was no fun for him. Um, so, you've had your fun. That's enough chat. Now it's hands up and face the music. Who, who wants to start? Our friend over here. My lovely assistant is hurtling towards you even as we speak. On the corner. First of all, thank you so much for those words of wisdom. Really helpful. And I was struck by the part you where you're talking about struggle and not having struggle be perhaps too transparent. And I'd love you to say more about that because that didn't resonate so much with me because I've found some of the most impactful sermons in my life have been where people have been open about how they've wrestled with the text because then I feel like, oh, great, I'm not alone. And then they've come through resolution. Can you say more about that balance between the, str the wrestling and the resolution? I, I take for granted that every person in this room, and got, you know, you've given up time in the middle of the week and probably paid some money, most of you, to be here. So it's not a representative sample of your average congregation. But I take for granted that every single person here spends probably over 50% of their Christian life doubting whether there's a God at all, um, probably spends about half the time reading the Bible thinking, what on earth is this ancient document? And, and what, how does it help us with Hurricane Irma? How does it help us with ISIS? How does it help us with social media or whatever's on your mind? I take for granted that, I mentioned Abraham and Isaac, that, you know, that, that everyone here reads the story of Pentecost and thinks, wow, they were having a good time. It never really feels much like that for me. I, I just take those things for granted. The congregation coming in, they've got all those questions. They've got those wrestling. They've had a rotten week. They're on the edge of an affair because the person at work keeps asking them and frankly they come home and think of fewer and fewer answers why they should say no. They're hardly talking to their son. They've always thought that their son was on the spectrum and they can't believe that at the age of 29 finally someone's going to give, give this condition a name. They're struggling at their work. They hate to be the person that says I should be more better paid but... but but frankly, everyone else around them seems to be better paid and they seem to get forgotten. They're saying, am I just a doormat that everyone's walking over? That this is what they're bringing into church every Sunday morning. They don't need me to say, I'm the pastor, I get paid for this, and actually I'm finding this really hard too. They don't need that. You know, to me, that's like crying at a funeral when you're the priest. Their job is to cry. Your, person, your job is to be the person that isn't crying so that they can think maybe life can go on at least for the next 20 minutes. If you start crying, the whole thing falls apart. And that's self-indulgent of you to do so, in my humble opinion. I may be losing that generous-hearted thing that I talked about. <laughs> it, that is not your, this is not your therapy session. You know, I, 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 I know a church, uh, this I'm talking about a long time ago, where one of the clergy, I'm very, very sorry, her spouse, her husband, had taken his own life, and every single sermon was about how she'd struggled through how her, you know, we're talking about the going back years ago, but she was still talking about it. Get yourself a therapist. Surround yourself with friends. Don't inflict it on the congregation. And then 10 years later, finally write your book, sign your copies, tell the congregation how it's been for those 10 years, and bring genuine wisdom out of that. But the work in progress I've got no real insight on how to cope with bereavement this week, but I'm talking about my former husband anyway. No, thank you. That's not ministry. That's self-indulgence. I'm really sorry for you, but the pulpit is not the place to, to explore that. So on a, on a taking it down a level from there, um, I'm, you know, I look at the passage of Abraham and Isaac, and I think, you know, I wonder what's going on here. Well, it turns out Kierkegaard had a lot to say about that. It turns out half the early fathers of the church had a whole bunch to say about that. So it turn, turns out that, uh, that great poets of the First World War had a great lot to say about it. By all means, talk about 
those insights that others have brought to this passage, provided you're going to do two things, provided you are not, uh, provided you're going to fit that into an argument that takes us somewhere. You know, any, any congregation member can read the story of Abraham and Isaac and thinks, oh, wow, this is pretty complex. And actually, if this was a story about me and my parent or me and my child, if these 10 or so verses were the whole story, I think some, you know, I think social services would be getting involved. But it's not a story about you and your child. It's one of the foundational... It, it, it's telling, you know, it's, it's saying there would have been no Israel had this happened. You know, this is cutting off the story at the source. There would have been no Israel. There would have been no church. There would have been no Bible without this story. Stay in that place and see how that feels. Now, that's a helpful thing. But to say a lot of us have had difficult relationships with our parents, and I'm one of them, and I'm now going to tell you about it. No. No. That's lazy. It's self-indulgent. It's superficial. It's trivial. Is that enough bad words? Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, wrestle with it, but wrestle with it in company. You're not the first person who's ever preached on this text. There's bunches of stuff out there. Get yourself out there or just use Google. Just get out there and find out what other people said about it. And actually, funnily enough, while you're befuddled and bedazzled by it, somebody out there has once said something that was really helpful about this. You're the preacher. It's your job to go and find that and bring that to the congregation. You're not just there to mirror the congregation's anxieties and frustrations back to them. Have I made myself clear? It's not going to be that bad for the second question, I promise. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> Got to yes. hold myself to okay. that now. Who's, um, Over here. Who's, who's next? There's, yeah. there's... Over here. Oh. Um, you've, you've made it abundantly clear the importance of thorough preparation. Do you recognize the fear of, uh, you mentioned reading 10 commentaries on the same text. Do you recognize the fear of preparing oneself to a standstill? Well, that's, that's the, I, I, I tried to address that point. I'll just repeat the question. Do I recognize the fear of preparing oneself to a standstill? I mean, that's why I said you get to the point where you're just bursting to say it. And I don't always, I said five to ten commentaries. Um, and that includes the Bible that I start with, which has sort of notes at the bottom. That counts as one. But there comes a point where I'm restlessly casting around almost like I've lost my keys and I'm trying to go around the house in a kind of mindless way searching for where I put them. I think there is a biblical parable or two about that. And sooner or later I find something. And sometimes I don't. And then I usually look at the epistle. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> but, but I mean, it, it, and, and that happened yesterday afternoon. I, I, I thought... I want to talk about Exodus next weekend. Exodus 14, text for next weekend. Um, I had a busy week, so I knew that yesterday afternoon was going to be the only time I was really going to have sustained time to, to think about it. I couldn't find any Exodus commentaries, so I thought, oh, I've got some good ones on Matthew. I'll have a look at the parable in Matthew. I looked through four or five commentaries. I thought, this isn't scratching anything for me. So I thought, I know I haven't got too much on Exodus handy, but I'm going to stay with that Exodus passage, and, and I'm going to go to the eyes closed ponder stage earlier on than. Um, and actually, it came fairly quickly, because, you know, the elephant in the room for Exodus 14 is, it's all very well for Charlton Heston, but what about, you know, do we really think it happened? And how come it, you know, I mean, talk about the obvious, large waves, big winds. Anybody heard about those in the last day or two? You know, why doesn't God do something useful for a change rather than do silly stories in the Bible? Why doesn't God do something like divert the odd hurricane in, in, the, in the Caribbean? You know, that's the obvious. You, you've got to address it. If you can't preach on that passage unless you name that right now, you could in uh, three weeks' time, but right now you can't. Um, and I thought, I've got to talk about this. <laughs> You know, here we are. It's a story about 
waves and winds and, uh, and, and it actually is the most important story in the whole of the Old Testament. It is the foundational story. And of course, within it, it ha it's one of, you know, and, and then you're thinking to yourself, and this is how I, I just take you through my thought process. I'm thinking this is about liberation. Well, liberation is one of the three big themes in the Old Testament. What are the others? Creation. Well, this looks very much like a creation story. The wind blew the, the chaos apart and dry land was formed. Hello. This is starting to sound a bit familiar. And the other th the key theme in the Old Testament is covenant. Well, this is, this is clearly the, the beginning of God's covenant with Israel. So the whole of the Old Testament is in those 13 verses. It's all there. And now I'm thinking, okay, I'm pretty much, I'm bursting to do this now. But then I'm thinking, hang on, wait, <laughs> you know, wait. What, what's the New Testament about? You know, the, the, what, and, and, and what's the early church about? The early church is about, about the early Christians finding in baptism the crystallization of resurrection and the crystallization of, of salvation. Well, funnily enough, these 13 verses of Exodus chapter 14, they're not just the whole of the Old Testament. They're the whole of the New Testament. They're the whole of the story of the church. They're the whole of the story of creation. And in that dancing and singing on the, on the shore with all the forces that oppress us, uh, laid out, it's heaven. It's the story of everything. <clears throat> I was disappointed. I didn't have the commentaries handy. But why do you need the commentaries if you've got all of that? So they, there's your sermon. You think, well, we'll start with a context. We've got a crisis of faith in our country. No one comes to church anymore. There's no one in this building right now, for example. Sorry, that was a joke, by the way. Um, there's all these critiques of Christianity on moral and historical and philosophical grounds. So acknowledge those. Start, you know, go back to the first questioner. Acknowledge, bless those. Say a bunch of us are feeling this, and if not, our spouse or our child or our parent, you know, over Christmas dinner is mocking us for being a churchgoer because of, you know, the philosophical, the moral, uh, uh, and the scientific kind of critiques, but also there's something su su subtle beyond that, and that is that these days, since around about, well, since Suez, basically, since 1956, we're beginning to recognize, and it's a fascinating uh, coincidence, shall we say, or perhaps more than a coincidence about Suez's geographical location, I'm talking about the post-colonial era, but funnily enough, Suez is perhaps the epitome of that since the Suez crisis. We're a post-colonial culture, and we read this story of Exodus 14, the crossing of the Red Sea, and hand on heart, eyes in mirror, trembling as we recognize it, we have to say we're the Egyptians in this story. Reading the story as if we're the Israelites justifies our whole colonial project, bringing freedom to the world. We are the new Israel, just like everybody used to say in the 1870s. But look at the story. We're the Egyptians. We're the oppressors. We're the people. You know, the people that are reading this story as the Israelites today, paradoxically and ironically, are living in Gaza today. We, we look much more like this. So on all kinds of grounds, historical, philosophical, scientific, and this um, ironic kind of cultural level, the Exodus story epitomizes everything that's problematic about Christianity, Christendom, and the church in the last 150 years. Okay, let's start with that. Let's acknowledge that. Let's get it to the point where we're thinking, ah, he's taking us over the cliff. This is just too painful for words. And then gently introduce all the things I just said before. This is the whole of the Old Testament. This is the whole of the Bible. 
This is the whole of the story of the church. This is the whole of story of Gen from Genesis to the maps. This is the whole story from creation through to heaven. It's not that bad a story after all, you know. Amen. You see, I mean, you just, you just got to get to the... I've just tried to take you through the stages, and, and I, don't, I don't see where over-preparation comes into that. In a sense, it's, it's, it only becomes over-preparation if your, in a sense, your fear that you won't have enough stuff get, prevents you, you know, in a sense, scleroticizes and clogs up the process. For me, the, you know, the breakthrough moment there was the juxtaposition of realizing, hang on, we're the Egyptians. And then also, hang on, this isn't just the whole story of the Old Testament. This is the whole deal. And the, and the kind of the electricity, the sort of Van de Graaff generator, remember those from school? You know, the, the buzz that happens in the, in the juxtaposition of those, bang. Then you think, hey, I'm dying for next Sunday now. I want to get in there. This is great. I'm really excited about this. And that's the sort of state of mind you want to be in when you, uh, when you finish preparing. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So next Sunday, next weekend, this next week, all 500 of us will prepare sermons <laughs> on Exodus 14 or, <laughs> or whatever. Do you agree that having prepared them, we can't swap them because, as Stephen was saying this morning about authenticity, my sermon has to come from me, yours from you, I can't be Sam, you can't be David, we can't be Stephen. That the sermon as an incarnation in our own story or not. Can, or if we can swap them, I can give you my email. Well, um, I'll start by saying I have sat in church, you know, in the congregation many times thinking... I wish you'd just taken something off the internet and spare us the pain. If, you know, if you're not going to go through the stages that I've just outlined, or, or obviously you've got to customize those and make them your own, and you already have. I'm just trying to be as clear as I can about saying, and I'm rigorous and honest with you about what this is what I do. And these are the temptations I have, for example, about ad-libbing, on, as you go, and how much, I mean, I could tell you so many stories about how many times I've regretted little asides that seemed funny at the time, but for which people haven't forgiven me 15 years later, and rightly so, perhaps. Um, but if you're not going to do that, for whatever, I don't know what reason, you know, I meant, I, I, I meant what I said by ending with, with saying, really, <laughs> have you got better things to do? Um, but if, for whatever reason, you've got nothing to say, you know, my grandmother, who wasn't, didn't have English as a first language, used to say, if you don't know what to say, say something else. <laughs> I mean, if you've got nothing to say, you could do a lot worse than either having an honourable silence or saying, you know, this is something that I think is really good, and try it. But there's a happy medium in between that, which is, you know, if it's an old... I mean, I'm going to talk in words of one syllable now. If there's a, an Old Testament passage, the chances are Walter Brueggemann's written something about it. <laughs> and if Walter Brueggemann's written something about it, you should jolly well be thinking of reading that if nothing's coming from the Lord. Because something's coming from Walter, and that's usually more than good enough for me to get me started. <laughs> So, you know, it's, in a sense, it doesn't have to be that hard in terms of where you, your go-to people, and you accumulate your go-to people over time. Um, but, so, so, I mean, uh, and, and then you customize that. If, you know, if, if someone emailed me and said, I was in a sermon in Cumbria, I was, you know, I was in a church in Cumbria, and this guy, well, in fact, the people do say this quite often, and this guy, he just, just virtually verbatim just taught straight out of something, it was some, some chapter in Learning to Dream again. I'm sure I recognize that. I would say hallelujah. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Maybe I'm doing something that's working. That, I never, ever feel... Um, you know, plagiarism isn't a word in my dictionary. I mean, Stephen addressed this this morning in terms of, of stories. 
I, th I learned that from my um, theology, uh, philosophical theology professor at seminary. He said, uh, originality is a construction. You know, originality is forgetting where you read it. <laughs> I, do, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't gone back through the text that I shared with you just now. But I, I, I think the truth is probably that most of the things that I've learned there haven't just come from the bottom of the, my heart of my experience. I've probably heard them, somebody else say them and thought, yeah, that's true. And then I've forgotten that somebody else said them and I have thought I was clever. You know, you have to have a bit of humility to recognize, but also that's how the, the church works. You know, it is, not, it is not for my glory. This is not about me. Um, so that's fine. Uh, I think this whole business of it's got to be authentically me, to me, I'd put that again with the first question about my struggle. Let's not exaggerate our own sacrificial ministries. They're actually not terribly interesting. They're probably a little bit like everybody else here today's sacrificial ministries. Fine, I, I take for granted, just like I said at perhaps too much length to the first questioner, I take for granted that you're struggling over your sermon. I mean, I, I hope you heard that in, in my remarks uh, this afternoon. It's, I'm not saying this is easy, but I'm saying God will provide. Um, stay in that place. And I, 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 to me, the most helpful of all the, the different things that Stephen said this morning was length doesn't matter. If you haven't got a lot to say, make sure the two minutes you say is fantastic. If it's fantastic for the first two minutes and then it goes into a kind of a nosedive, cut out the rest. Just give them the two minutes. I've heard so many American Episcopalian sermons that were absolutely brilliant for the first three minutes and then went into a nosedive. There's almost a culture in the Episcopal Church, sorry for members of the Episcopal Church or those who love it dearly, which I do, um, but there's a kind of culture of, of, of sticking a few thoughts on, the, on, on, on an envelope and then it starts brilliantly and then somehow assuming the Holy Spirit will take over like uh, Dumbo's feather and finish the job. And funnily enough, I've never been there when the Holy Spirit pulled it off. Just make it two minutes. There's nothing wrong with two minutes. That's fine. If, it's, if it shows you the face of God. So I, 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 this authenticity, individual struggle thing, I think you've got the message, for what I think about that stuff now. I think it's a good, but it's somewhere down at sort of 59 on my goods of preaching. It's not a very high priority good. I think people waving are people who really, really, really want to ask a question. The people who are putting their hands up are just people who, you know, they'll ask a question if you've got the time. I'm just remembering that um, St. Paul said, always think of people better than yourself. And I wondered, in fact, whether it was something... Sorry, always... Always think of people... Think of people. Yeah. Better, better than you than think yourself. of yourselves, yeah. And I was thinking, what do you think about the fact that when you preach... You preach to the wisdom of that congregation, and sometimes there'll be people who will have a better take on it than you have, but you would be able to somehow combine with theirs to actually make something beautiful and meaningful. What a fascinating question. So the, the question is, uh, there will be people in every congregation who've got a better take on it than, than you have, and somehow what you're aiming to do is to combine, you know, to blend your insights with their lives and, and out of that make something more beautiful than would otherwise come. Um, I, I, think, I think there's something that, uh, for which probably the best word is, is, is partnership, which I think is, is what you're describing, but it's certainly the way I'd like to respond to what you're describing. And that is to say... Um, the lay people that I've known over 26 odd years now at ordained ministry have, have been in many, many cases, you know, fantastic people of the, of, the, of the people you describe, honestly trying with astonishing humility to, uh, to be disciples of Jesus. 
But for that sort of package to work, they need, for them to do their job, I need to do my job. They have every reason to expect of me that if I'm going to stand up for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes on a Sunday, I will have done my homework. And my homework, of course, it doesn't just mean scriptural commentaries. Of course, it doesn't mean working out an argument. Of course, it means saying, um, knowing your congregation. Now, there's a story, it's funny, I wholly admired Stephen for saying, you know, I've never told a joke in a sermon, um, which was a fascinating thing to say. I remember long, long ago, um, I'm not going to disclose the, the um, uh, location, uh, I, I remember a, a story about a man who went in to see the, um, the family planning nurse and was furious because he said uh, you gave my wife these pills and she always forgets everything so I took them and look what's happened (laughs) and for some reason and that was back in the days when I used to preach extempore for some reason I think it has to be the Holy Spirit I didn't tell that story even though it seemed very appropriate for the sermon unforgettable as I'm sure it was after the service I discovered the 14 year old girl in the congregation was pregnant I felt very protected that day for the fact that something had told me not to um, not to tell no, you know, not to tell that story for reasons that you don't need me to explain but there's something the reason I mention that now is you know, knowing your congregation, <laughs> reading the signs of the times, obviously paying attention to what's in the water publicly in the news and all that kind of thing. That's all part of, I think, what Stephen called, do you know what you're talking about? And, but there are particular things. You know, why do you have ordained ministry? You have ordained ministry because some things, prayer, preaching, baptism, Eucharist, to name the most obvious four, are so vital to the life of the church that people need to be set aside to do them not just well enough but outstandingly well. Otherwise, why bother with ordained ministry ministry at all? So I'm ordained. I've been set aside to to do those things fantastically well and everything that goes with them. Um, you know, so for baptism, that means catechesis, preparing people, and so on. Not necessarily doing it all myself, but cre- you know, creating a pattern of lay ministry where this is done, you know, that kind of thing. So I need, I need to keep my side of the covenant. I, I need to preach as, you know, really, really well if I'm expecting that lay person to live unbelievably well. That's the covenant that I think I'm in. And and if I find that, you know, some ghastly detail about I see a member of my congregation in the newspaper because they've been found out as part of some corporation that has been, you know, putting putting its customers over a barrel for the last 10 years, and I think I'm really sorry that all the sermons that person has listened to don't seem to have amounted to a shaping of moral character that prevented that happening. I may think that as things, and then I think back to those sermons saying, was I giving my absolute best? Was that person hearing a gospel in a thrilling way that enabled them to take the risk of challenging practices in their workplace? You know, that kind of thing. So, yes, uh, it's a partnership. Uh, Of course I need to live a holy life. Um, And of course they do too. Uh, but I have a specific calling to speak the gospel to them on a Sunday or wherever. I must honor that calling. And if I find it hard or if I'm not very good at it, go back to the car analogy. I wasn't very good at driving a car when I started. Take the time to get better. I've got time for just maybe one or two more. Thank you. Um, Could you say something about... um being good to great 
in um, pastoral services like weddings and funerals where we're often preaching um, on the same text um, many times and trying to really bring that gospel message to particular people but to bring that alive. Well, the question is how to be good to great for in pastoral services like weddings and funerals where we're often preaching on the same text. Uh, my short answer is by not preaching on the same text. Um, the way that I keep myself fresh is by not preaching the same sermon over and over again. It's got to be good news to me and not, uh, and not just to the congregation. That's where I think there is a personal dimension, coming back to the David's earlier question. Um, so at a funeral, I, for me, you, know, you, you invite the uncle or the brother-in-law to do the eulogy, or you hint that that would be lovely, or you invite them to, to put in the order of service a kind of obituary, which means you don't need to say he was always there for you, and he was great at the bowls club, and you know the, that that you don't need to do a catalogue of of his life events. You have one thing alone to do at the funeral when you're preaching. You have to say, "This is how Ronnie showed us the face of God." That's your job. And because we're not all Ronnie, in fact, I'd be happy to put money there may not be a single Ronnie with us even today then the chances are that for one person, Jacob wrestling with the angel is going to be the right reading. And for another person, you know, put on the whole armor of God is going to be the right reading. I reckon I've preached at somewhere between 200 and 250 funerals in my ministry, at a guess. I think I've probably preached on about 180 different passages. Um, and one, of course, you can say, well, the family wanted, and then you said, do you mind if I also have? Uh, the family probably only wanted one reading, and yes, of course, if it's 1 Corinthians 13, that can be a challenge, but 1 Corinthians 13 actually has got an awful lot of adjectives in it. Love is patient. Love is kind. You don't have to preach on the whole passage every time. You know, Ronnie was, for all you might know about and say about him, and, and people have been saying things in the last few days about Ronnie, and I've heard a few of those things. At the end of the day, Ronnie was kind. Think about that word kind. Kind comes from the word kin. Ronnie was somehow part of the fabric of this community, as if he was kin to this community. And do you know what? I know this is going to sound a bit precious, but, but when Jesus became a human being, he became kind. He became our kin. And, and, and in seeing how Ronnie was somehow inseparable from the fabric of this community, how Ronnie was kind to this community, it just helps me reflect on what it means for Jesus to be kind to each one of us. And we're here today because... We're really sad that that kindness, maybe it wasn't always best expressed in Ronnie, but that kindness has died. Jesus' kindness to us never dies. Ronnie helps me see that. Bless God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us Ronnie. Uh, one or two more? Um, can I Ooh. just, um, I think in your method, I, I recognise Augustine. Well, um, I'll take that. I mean, there's, um, <laughs> uh, the old fellow's been at it for a while, and it's time for one of the younger guys to come in. Yeah. Um, which I have a lot of sympathy for, and I hope I try to emulate. Um, but lots of people say that the rules of what you might call classic rhetoric don't apply any longer. We don't live in that age. Don't be bothering yourself about the, these silly arguments. Um, you must, to connect, you must communicate in a different way. It's kind of Radio 1 as against Radio 4. Um, Nobody or, listens to Radio 4, do they? <laughs> I can't even see anybody in this place that listens to Radio 4. Yeah. 
So how do you, how, could you please give me some well, ammunition to answer that argument? Ammunition. I'll say uh, things that are done fantastically well never go out of fashion. Things that are done poorly don't deserve to be in fashion in the first place. You can't say, I was, uh, when I was at college, I was taught that a sermon should have three points. So uh, here's the first, there's the third, and oh, there's the second. Amen. You know, that's not worth anybody's listening to. Uh, you know, a, a bad Radio 4 isn't worth anybody's switching on. I'm, I'm the first to say that use the screen, use brilliant use of technology, use strobes, use um, waterfalls, pictures. You know, it can be done fantastically well, and it's brought me closer to God, and I'd be the first to celebrate it. I'm terrible at that. Every time I've done a PowerPoint presentation, it's, it's been, uh, I'll be back to you in a second, talk amongst yourselves. You know, I don't do it because I'm rubbish at it. And I, yes, I could take my own advice and get better at it. But your average PowerPoint presentation does nothing for me. In fact, I nod off as soon as the, color, the, the, the lights go down. And so it has to be done fantastically well. And okay, I've got a particular educational background, I've got a particular disposition and character and, 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 and interest in, in, in culture, which locates me, probably similar to where you're located, the two Augustines in the room. And, and there'll be another person, and they may be, you know, 18 years old, for whom it's the other way around. <laughs> they, would, they would slide more easily into the, the screen and the waterfall stuff and make their confession as they see children fighting on a screen and that will lead them into confessing and, you know, a sort of visual liturgy like that. And they would find the way that I taught a stretch. But I hope that they would be like me, the first to say that when it's done fantastically well... It's electrifying. And if it's done badly, it doesn't deserve anyone's listening to it. And the same is true of the other way around. It's a mixed economy. What I can't stand is when people lose their confidence in something that can be thrilling and electrifying and transformative and settle for second-rate drivel instead of another genre. That's just... That's just a... It's not only a desperate lack of confidence, it's a, it's a sort of a... It's a lack of respect to 2,000 years of church history, people trying to get really good at this. It's, you know, if a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing well. It's, it, it, I have got, I'm not here to stand up and support second-rate preaching, and nobody here is. You wouldn't have come to a conference unless you wanted to be the absolute best that you can be. Um, but we've all, we've all been to a sermon that I, I, I remember when I said, worship should be about joy. I remember hearing the same preacher say the immortal words, which I have once managed to work into an, a, a, an address, not a sermon. Eighthly, but not finally. <laughs> Think about it. Okay, just one more. We'll take one more. And, and uh, um. In the past, I've heard you uh, strike a great balance between gospel-based social comment and preaching politics. Can you talk a little bit about how you do that? Well, I, 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 I thank you. Uh, thanks for the compliment. And, and, and I, it's obviously something very close to my heart. I'm, at a, I'm based at a church which has got a national, international reputation for working with uh, significantly disadvantaged people. But I absolutely don't want to be the vicar of a church that thinks because we care about poor, the poor, we don't believe in the resurrection. And you all know that 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 configuration exists, and in the Episcopal Church in America it exists almost more than it, than it does here. That assumption that if you, if you care about social issues, you've somehow gone soft on whatever. To me, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, I, th I think, uh, I, you know, I have a rule, and I sort of hinted at it, that you, you know, you've got to learn to paint like Constable before you get to paint like Picasso. Uh, and you've got to show you're comfortable with the Bible. You, not that, you know, in that terrifying story about All Saints Margaret Street, Father, 
you're preaching on the prophet Habakkuk this morning. You know, not, you know, not pretending to be something we're never going to be, a sort of a walking scriptural commentary, something that was just suffused with details about the second verse of the first chapter of Joel or something. You know, this is ridiculous. Um, but you've got, you know, you've got to be comfortable in, hopefully, the kind of things I've tried to model today. How, you know, how to read Exodus 14 and see it as not just 13, you know, challenging verses from a 2,500-year-old text, but the gospel of life for all people everywhere forever. So, to, you know, shape yourself like that and, and gain the trust of the congregation because there are, there are an unbelievable number of people out there. I hate to say it's a majority. I don't know if it's a majority, but there's a lot of people out there who think that sermons are just an opportunity for an opinionated talking head to visit his or her vitriol upon an unwary captive audience and and you know you, you know people think that because they say you should preach about that on sunday vicar and, and they're not saying you should expound the glories of god's open heart to your congregation you're saying you know they're saying they're very cross about something in politics right now and you should somehow download a whole bunch of what I call, you know, editorials or blog site stuff, you know, on, on the poor people who have to listen to it. Um, I, think, I think about one in ten, I mean, I did this, I think, 2nd of July. I can't remember. It was just after the election. Uh, and, and to be perfectly honest, and I'm not going to go into party politics here, I, could ha I put my hand on my heart on about the Thursday of that week, and I thought... Has there ever been a time in my life where I've been less clear about what to hope for? You know, it's a, if you'll forgive the Irish um, prejudice, it's a kind of if I wanted to go to Waterford, I wouldn't start from here kind of moment. Um, and I thought, you know, I, I get, get these moments, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday of the week. I think I've got to talk about this on Sunday. But nine times out of ten, the passage of Scripture actually is begging you to do that. It's not like, you know, I've prepared my notes on the scripture and I'm going to, turn, I'm going to toss them away because I've got something really powerful. That kind of melodrama that you get in a lot of films and things. It's not that. It's look at the scripture again and say, perhaps this has got a word for us in this situation. And so I thought, I said, said to the Conrad, I, I don't usually do this and I'm going to talk for a little bit longer than I usually do. But I've been feeling heavy of heart in the last few days because I, I haven't known what to hope for. And I, and I want to spend some time with you exploring what I think is actually going on in this country at the moment on a historical and theological level. And I think, and I, I can't, to be honest, remember what passage I preached on, but, you know, and I think this passage from Romans, actually, it may not be asking exactly the same question, but I think it's got a word for us about this. And, and that's... You know, that's after five years as vicar of that congregation. I thought maybe it's time I get the right to do this. But, you know, on your second Sunday preaching, when you say, I'm absolutely appalled about what they're doing about migration and the Tory cabinet is a, a load of dot, dot, dots and, 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 and frankly, it's not the gospel, they're not Christian, how can they claim, you know, no. Shout it in the shower. But that is not a sermon. Where is the good news from the Lord in that? Where has people seen the face of God? It's just one long denunciation in which, you know, as they say about speaking truth to power, they're always the assumption that they've got the power and you've got the truth. Who do you think you are? <laughs>